Hello and welcome to this companion to A.K. Warder's Grammar Guide, An Introduction to Pali. And you can find a link to this in the description below. So today we come to Lesson 7 and we'll be looking at the past participle. This is Pali Studies on the Learn Pali channel. Now, past participles can be difficult to get your head around, but they are extremely important in Pali. Lesson 7 is where many students become unstuck, and this is because I think Warder expects his readership to know already both what participles are, what the passive voice is, and how the two interrelate. And throughout this chapter, he touches on many complex areas of linguistics, and so it can be hard to follow if you don't already have this knowledge. So to simplify, I'm going to rearrange the order of the sections a little, and deal with new to nouns first, and then the instrumental case. But then we'll spend some time recapping verb tense and voice, to get an idea of just how participles function, before going on to look at how they work in Pali. But you might find you need to return and re-watch some of the sections, and remember that there are also some detailed tutorials on both verb tense and voice to help too. Right, let's begin then with something hopefully familiar. Back in lesson one, if you remember, we touched on the gender of noun stems. Every noun has a gender, and substantives usually have just the one gender, either masculine, neuter or feminine. And we typically classify noun stems by both gender and the letter in which their stem ends because these have a common pattern of declension. Remember, a noun stem is just a noun without its declensional ending, and these are how they're listed in the dictionary. So in this section, Warder introduces us to a new noun gender, the neuter. And we can see here that neuter noun stems all end in a short vowel. There are a small number which end in a consonant. But in this lesson, we're just looking at the A stem neuter declension. And Warder gives us, as a paradigm, the example of yana, meaning a carriage or a vehicle. So first we can see that the neuter noun, in the nominative and accusative case for singular nouns, take the same ending, ang. And the vocative is the bare stem ending. And in the plural, they all take the same ani ending. And if we compare this now to the masculine A stem nouns that we've seen before, we can see that the neuter declension is different in the plural and the nominative singular, but similar in the vocative and accusative singular. And these, in fact, are the only differences, as the rest of the declensional case endings are exactly the same in the neuter as they are in the masculine. And we can see this if we now look at the instrumental case ending for both the neuter and the masculine. Here we can see that A stem nouns take ana in the singular and a he in the plural. There's also an archaic case ending in the plural, ab he, which you may also sometimes come across. So before we move on to the instrumental case, Warder also gives us the instrumental case endings for the pronouns that we saw back in lesson five. So if we look at the personal pronouns, the first and second person are a little irregular in the instrumental, but we can see the ana ending in the third person masculine and neuter. And we can see ehi in the plural too. And don't forget these third person forms can also be demonstrative. This is the pronoun stem ta, so means that and those but there are also other pronoun stems, and Warder gives us ima, which means this and these. The pronoun forms can be a little daunting, as there are literally hundreds of them. But don't panic, as I've collected together all the pronoun forms and put them into a single document, a link to which is down in the description below. What's important to remember here is those characteristic instrumental endings. So if we now concentrate on the instrumental case, this case largely overlaps in meaning with the English prepositions 
by or with, and it's used to indicate the means by which something is done. We'll see more uses of the instrumental case in the next lesson, but for now we'll just stick with this simple definition. So if we wish to render he locks the door with a key into Pali, we'd inflect the verb into the third person to match the subject he, and the noun for door would be placed in the accusative case because it's the object of the verb, whilst the word for key is declined in the instrumental to indicate that it's the instrument by which the door is locked. And the general order of a Pali sentence is to have the verb at the end and the subject first, along with things which belong to the subject. In this case, that's the instrumental. And this is followed by the accusative object. So if we now look at a couple more examples of the instrumental. So we have, by wisdom, one obtains happiness. And this could be rendered equally, through wisdom, one obtains happiness. And it is taught by the Buddhas. You might notice here that desetang isn't a normal verb. In fact, it's a past participle. Warder gives us a long list of participle stems, and I want to next dig into how these are formed. But remember those instrumental case endings above, as we'll be seeing those later. Now it's important to be able to recognise past participles, and I think the best way to do this is to understand how they are formed. So let's break this down. Participles can be formed on the present verb stem, or more commonly, on the verbal root. And the past participle is formed by adding the infix ta. And when this is placed on the present stem, the infix takes a joining i sound. Whereas, if added to a root, and the root ends in a vowel, the infix ta is added directly. But if the root ends in a consonant, some take the joining i sound, whilst with others the consonant and the t may assimilate. Now to keep this short, I'm not going to go into the details of that here. But generally, this results in the duplication of the t sound. Finally, for verbal roots which end in an r or an n, these can be dropped before taking the infix ta directly and sometimes a final M is dropped too, though these also often assimilate, resulting in nutter. So notice that the distinctive feature in all of these is that ta ending. But it's important to realise that these are just the base forms, and these then need to be declined. So in this table, I've placed the nominative ending of the masculine and the new neuter gender that we've just seen, and for completeness, the feminine also. So if we now look at our last example, Tang Dese Tang Budehi, we can recognise that Dese Tang is a past participle which has been formed on the present stem, and this then declines in the neuter singular in order to agree with its subject, which is the pronoun Tang. And if we now take one of Warder's examples, we have approached. The root verb, upasang kam, to approach, takes the infix ta, and the m and the t assimilate to result in upasang kanta. And this then has to be declined to match its subject, here the pronoun we, and so it takes the plural nominative declension. We have approached, or we have arrived. Well, that's a brief look at the formation and declension of past participles. But before we push deeper into their uses, I think it would be helpful to look at participles in English. OK, a participle is a type of verbal adjective, and that means it's part verb and part adjective. Essentially, there are two types in English, the ing form and the ed form. And the ing form is traditionally called a present participle, whilst the ed form is traditionally called a past participle. This is for regular verbs, and that means that both the past participle 
and the past tense are formed by adding ed. But with irregular verbs, the past tense is mainly formed by a vowel change, and in this case, the past participle is often formed with the ending en. But there are actually many irregular past participle forms in English too. Now, in this lesson, we're just focusing on the past participle. So for now, just remember those ed and en forms. Okay, so you can see how the participle is formed on a verbal root, and so it shows features of both tense and voice. But they function like adjectives, and so also behave like nouns, which means they can play many roles within a sentence, and also makes them a bit tricky to get your head around. But if we break this down. Participles are used in the formation of both aspect and voice, and we might term these finite as it involves tense, as well as non-finite roles where they may simply be acting as adjectives, or even as a substantive noun. So to help us, let's first recap what voice is. When we start to learn a language, any language, we begin with the active voice. For instance. The dog chases the cat. Here, the dog is the agent because he is the one performing the action, doing the chasing. Whilst the cat is called the patient, this is the thing undergoing or being affected by the action. Now, these terms shouldn't be confused with those of the subject, which means the grammatical subject. That is the noun or phrase to which the verb has been made to agree, or the object. The object of the verb is the noun or phrase that is required in order to complete the meaning of the verb. And we've seen that this type of verb is called a transitive verb. So, with an active sentence, the agent, the one doing the action, and the subject, the noun with which the verb is inflected to agree. Are the same, and if the verb is transitive, any direct object is also what endures or undergoes the action, and so is also the patient. But we can reverse this sentence and make the cat the subject by saying, "The cat is chased by the dog." This is the passive voice. The cat is still the patient enduring the action. And the dog is still the agent, doing the chasing. But now the cat is the grammatical subject of the verb. It's this noun with which the verb agrees. For instance, we'd say, "The cats are chased." So, with the passive voice, it's the patient which is the subject of the verb, and the agent is optional. We don't have to include it in order for the sentence to make sense. But if we do. We use an instrumental preposition in English. Also, note that the verb changes to become a combination of the verb to be plus a past participle. That ed ending that's a past participle and not the past tense. The verb to be is termed an auxiliary verb or a helping verb, and it's this that carries the tense and actually agrees with the subject in English. And a combination of verbs like this goes by the technical term periphrasis. And in English, the passive voice is always expressed by periphrasis, the combination of the verb to be expressing the tense and a past participle expressing the action. And one more note: you may also see the agent called the logical subject, as opposed to the grammatical subject. But actually, I find this a bit counterintuitive. Well, that's the passive voice. There are more tutorials on this subject, both in English and in Pali. If you want more. Next, let's look at how participles are used in the formation of tense and aspect. Voice, active and passive, should not be confused with tense. In English, tense is a combination of time, past, present, and future, as well as aspect. Which, put simply, is how complete the action is, whether it's ongoing at the time, which is the progressive aspect, and is expressed by a form of to be 
and a present participle, or whether it's complete, which is the perfective aspect, and is expressed by a form of to have and a past participle. We can see that in English, besides the simple past and present, all other time and aspect combinations are expressed by an auxiliary verb and a type of participle, and that's called periphrasis. Now, the traditional terms past participle and present participle are a bit misleading, because as you can see, we can use them to express any time period. However, the present participle is associated with the progressive aspect, whilst the past participle is associated with the perfective aspect. And the key thing to take away from this for the moment is that past participles with the auxiliary have are used to create the perfective aspect. Well, that's in the active voice anyway, because we can also do the same in the passive voice. In the passive voice. Every time and aspect combination, including the simple, is expressed by an auxiliary and a past participle. So the simple aspect takes a form of to be and a past participle. I am seen, whilst the progressive takes a form of to be and being plus a past participle. I am being seen, whereas the perfective takes a form of to have and been and then a past participle. I have been seen, and if you want more on aspect and tense in English, there are some more tutorials. So I hope you understand now just how important participles are in the formation of both tense and aspect. Okay, so now I think we're ready to go back and look at past participles in Pali. So we said that participles were part verb and part adjective. And we've seen that they're based on a verbal root, and show features of both tense and voice, like a verb. But they function like an adjective, and so they decline like nouns, taking case, number, and gender, rather than inflecting like a verb. And if we now remind ourselves of the roles that they play, we've just seen how they're used in the creation of aspect, both in the active and passive voice. But they also can be simply used as adjectives to qualify another noun, or occasionally, like any adjective in Pali, they can act as a noun themselves. So let's now take a look at each of these functions in turn. First, let's take the active voice, and like English, the past participle is very much associated with the perfective verb aspect, and also like English, we can think of this as being created. By a combination of a past participle with an auxiliary verb, and in Pali this can be any form of the verbs as, who, or bu, which all mean to be. Now each is used in a slightly different way, and we'll see more of this in lesson twenty-four, hopefully. But for now, when a past participle is used to create a finite verb tense, it will be in the nominative case. And will also agree in both number and gender with the subject, whilst the auxiliary, being a verb, will agree in both person and number with that subject. So these are the longhand forms of "I have arrived" and "You have arrived." Literally, "I have come" and "You have come." Both express the present perfective tense, and note is the subject doing the action. And so, therefore, it's active voice. And as we've seen before, because the verb ending implies any subject pronoun, it's quite common to drop this pronoun, which will just leave the auxiliary and the past participle. And you might also find that the initial a of an as verb is eluded after a vowel, as these sounds tend to run into one another. And conversely, it's common also to include the pronoun but drop the auxiliary, as it's acting as a copula, linking the participle to the subject. In fact, this is probably the most common construction, especially in the third person, that is, when the subject is anything other than I or you. So it's quite common to see a subject noun 
followed by a past participle, without any auxiliary. So there are three different variations here that are all used to express the same meaning. And to render these into English, we simply use a form of the verb to have, has, had, etc., and the past participle. But past participles used in the active voice are actually quite rare. In fact, they're restricted to just those formed on intransitive verbs, and especially to verbs of motion, like to come or go, as we've just seen. But past participles used to create the passive voice are, by comparison, very common, and these are formed from transitive verbs, as it's the patient that becomes the subject. So let's now look at the passive voice. So in the passive voice, remember it's the subject of the verb that is undergoing or experiencing the action. And again, these can be found in those three variations, but commonly with just the auxiliary in the first and second person, and without the auxiliary in the third person. And again, in this case, the past participle will be in nominative, like the subject, and agree in both gender and number. And as these tend to represent the present perfective tense, we render them into English with a form of the verb to have, and then been to create the passive voice followed by the past participle. So now, if we look at the examples given by Warder, Evan May Satang, May is a first-person pronoun in the instrumental case, meaning by me, and Satang is the past participle. Of the verb meaning to hear, and it's in nominative singular. There's no specific subject, and when the subject is impersonal like this, it's quite common to put the past participle in the neuter gender. So we can render this: it has been heard, and we get literally thus by me it has been heard. And if we look at the next one, Maya ime. Sata nimata. We can see here from the ta ending that nimata is a past participle, here meaning created, and ime is a third person plural pronoun, meaning these, and sata meaning beings or creatures, is also nominative and plural, and nimata agrees with these in gender, case, and number. So these beings are the subject. They are what. Is being created, and maya is a first-person instrumental pronoun, meaning by me, and so here this is the agent, the one doing the creating. By me, these beings have been created. So we can take a few things away from this. First is that the subject, that is the grammatical subject, will always be marked by the nominative case irrelevant of voice. And a telltale feature of the passive voice is that if the agent is expressed, it will be in instrumental case. If there's no agent in instrumental, it's a good idea to check if the verb is intransitive or not, in which case the sentence will be active. But if the subject is undergoing the action, and the past participle is from a transitive verb, or there's an agent in instrumental case, then it's likely to be in the passive voice. And one final point is that, as English tends to favour the active voice, many translators flip passive sentences into the active voice by making any agent into the subject of the sentence. So the last examples can be rendered: "Thus I have heard," and "I have created these beings." Well, now we can move on to the non-finite cases. As adjectives, past participles agree with the number, case, and gender of the nouns they qualify. So here, the past participle is merely qualifying the subject noun, and so is in masculine nominative singular to agree with Brahmano. And of course, they can also qualify object nouns, in which case they'll take the accusative. And occasionally, there may also be a subject complement. That is where a copula or linking verb is implied.
And finally, past participles like any adjective in Pali can also on occasion act as a noun, in which case they will always take the neuter gender. For example, here Barsitang is the past participle of the verb to speak, literally meaning spoken. But here it's been used as a noun to mean that which was spoken or the speech has been heard. The important thing to take away from all this is to see how past participles are part verb and part adjective. And so when used as a verb, they have features of both aspect and voice. But they can also be used as an adjective where they simply qualify another noun. Well, thank you for sticking with this. As I know that many struggle with Lesson 7, I've tried to explain the sections as clearly as I can. Have a go at Exercise 7. The answers are no longer in the appendix, as the first six were, but I will give you a link to them in the next lesson. And feel free to check out the other tutorials on voice and tense if you need more help. And in the next lesson we'll be looking in more detail at the instrumental case as well as present participles.